Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at Noon starts now. But we're dry outside right now, so some good news there. But meteorologist Brandon Rue is tracking storms for the start of your Memorial Day weekend. Of course, the weather tops our news here at noon. Thank you for joining us. I'm Everod Casimi alongside meteorologist Brandon Rue, yes. and we're heading into uh, a weekend where things are looking up. Well, I got a text from my daughter who said the baseball coach here wants to know if they can play their game today. I'm advising don't cancel your plans, but we all need to keep a very close eye oh. on radar. The okay. local forecasters app, of course, will have more on that coming up. But in the meantime, we're looking here live at Storm Tracker 4, and we'll get to some of those showers. Look at that sky over Metro Detroit with more clouds than clearing, but we do have some patchy areas areas of blue sky helping us try to warm upper 60s low 70s and a little southwest wind really isn't all that strong as we take a look at uh, some of these showers out here not much to them but along and north of m59 as we zoom in close here to the clinton township and mount clemens area we have a pretty decent soaker lightning tracker is on not seeing any of that and a lot of these showers are just ahead of a cold front that is slowly moving to the south there it is there and just will take its time most of the afternoon the showers are confined to areas north of M59, but by 3 4 p.m., better shower chances, more sort of across the entire area. So that's what we need to watch through the middle and late afternoon, especially, Evrod. All righty, Brandon, thank you so much. Now let's get you updated on the latest about the baby formula shortage across the country. Over in Dearborn, hundreds of cars are lined up to try and get their hands on baby formula. The Dearborn Department of Public Health partnered with local nonprofits to hold an emergency baby formula distribution event. Volunteers are handing out free baby formula. This is at the Ford Community and Performing Arts Center, and that's going to go until 2 o'clock this afternoon. It has been a staple of Detroit's dining scene since 1965, but overnight, the popular restaurant Traffic Jam and Snug in Midtown actually caught fire. Fire crews spent all morning working to try and save the restaurant and to keep the flames from spreading to nearby businesses like Shinola, which is right next door. Local force Nick Monticelli joins us with more this afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm going to step out of the way here because this is what the employees and friends of Traffic Jam and Snug are dealing with right now, just trying to clean up a little bit. This is a, a very small portion, a very, very small portion of the work to be done. Uh, if anything, uh, because we're told the building is destroyed, traffic jam is snug, but we're going through this rubble, seeing if there's anything that might be able to be salvaged. Oh, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Many in Midtown woke up to smoke and flashing lights this morning, finding out a Detroit staple is destroyed. Utterly terrible. The restaurant's been in the neighborhood for forever. It was here before any of this neighborhood got built up. It's a classic. People love to come here. It's just it's really a shame. The fire started around 2 a.m., but we do not know how yet. This cell phone video from a loft rooftop across the street shows just how bad it was, gutting traffic jam and snug from the inside. Oh, it's total. The whole building. There's a wood floor in there and everything else like that, so it just took off. Which is kind of hard to imagine because when you look from the outside, it looks like it might be okay. Yeah, but it's just the walls. <laughs> it's all the inside's gone. The current owners bought the restaurant in the late 90s. The building itself has been here since 1928. It's sad to see an occupied uh, restaurant or any business go this way. As the sun rose, reality set in. The owner did not want to talk on camera, but is already talking about how to move forward. The family's owned it for a long time, you know, and yeah, it's, just, it's really a shame. Now, when this happened, the restaurant was closed, so nobody was inside, nobody hurts. There is some other good news to pass along as well. Shinola, which is right next door, they share a wall, but it's a brick wall and essentially a fire wall, so the fire didn't spread. There's no damage over there. Also, you can't see it from here, but there is a brewery on the back side of this. They own that. It's part of their operation. It's an old Victorian home that they purchased and converted. That also doesn't have any damage because, again, it was separate and there was a firewall, a brick wall in between. We're in Midtown, Nick Monticelli, Local 4. We certainly feel for the owners there, and this community has been going there for years. Nick, thank you for the update. 
Well, the small town of Uvalde in Texas is still trying to make sense of of what happened there on Tuesday. There's new information from officials that's really adding to the confusion and the pain and the frustration that's being felt by residents there. Wendy Wolfolk is in Texas with the latest. Emotions still raw here in South Texas. The new details and changing facts making the pain and suffering even worse. The new building, I thought those doors were locked. In a small town already grappling with the sudden loss of 19 children and two teachers, official answers only leading to more questions. Why the gunman was able to enter the school through an unlocked door and was there a school officer on campus and was that school officer armed? No, no. But Wednesday, this is what officials said. There was a brave uh, consolidated independent school district resource officer that approached him, engaged him. And at that time, there was not gunfire was not exchanged. Four minutes after the shooter entered, local police arrived to the chaotic scene. They don't make entry initially because of the gunfire they're receiving. It took approximately one hour for the U.S. Border Patrol tactical team to make entry, then shoot and kill the suspect, but not in time to save 10-year-old Lexi Rubio. <laughs> oh, no, I know I can't hold her, but I can touch her. At least it's the only thing I can hold. The off-duty Uvalde Sheriff's deputy had just seen his daughter at a school ceremony 30 minutes before. Do you know what it's like to be there and that we didn't, that I didn't take her home? I made this huge mistake and you can never fix it. Parents' unimaginable pain that may never totally heal. President Biden and the First Lady are planning to give their personal condolences with a visit here on Sunday. The first of 21 funerals planned to begin next week. That's the latest in Uvalde, Texas. I'm Wendy Woolfolk. Now back to you. Wendy, thank you for the update. And now to the shakeup in the race for governor. Five Republican candidates are now officially off the ballot after a split vote along party lines at the State Board of Canvassers meeting on Thursday. Those candidates include former Detroit Police Chief James Craig, Perry Johnson, Donna Brandenburg, Michael Markey, and Mike Brown. There are thousands of fraudulent petition signatures across their campaigns, but both Craig and Johnson's campaigns plan to fight this in court. The Bureau had a large task before it, and it did a valiant effort. Unfortunately, they cannot do random sampling, and they cannot do automatic disqualification. The Board of Canvassers has said many of these signatures were collected by hired petitioners, but it's the responsibility of the campaigns to make sure that they are verified before being submitted. The SEC has filed fraud charges against a Detroit-based hedge fund. The complaint says Andrew Binnelbrooks, owner of EIA All Weather Alpha Partner, solicited and raised $39 million from over 100 investors for a private fund that he managed. It went on to say Middlebrooks made false and misleading statements to prospective investors, claiming the fund was performing better than it was. The SEC says he transferred at least $470,000 to his wife's business, $750,000 to his personal account, and $64,000 to pay for jewelry. The FBI agents accused of botching the investigation into the Larry Nassar sex assault case will not be charged. That's the decision from the Justice Department, which just completed its third review of the claims against two agents. According to the Inspector General's report, the FBI agents were first alerted about the sex abuse in 2015, but failed to open a formal investigation or inform federal or state authorities in Michigan. Nasser was finally arrested in November of 2016 during an investigation by Michigan State University Police. Neither agent is still with the FBI, with one being fired and the other retiring. There's a new report that's shedding light on these virtual learning apps. Coming up, we'll tell you why the Federal Trade Commission is getting involved and what these apps were doing during the pandemic. But first, the CDC is investigating more cases of monkeypox across the U.S. and issuing a travel alert.